All right. Um, I think we're ready to start. It's a good sign that everybody's uh, talking amongst each other, but uh, we have uh, a lot more to do today, so um, you'll have to uh, compartmentalize your socializing to the uh, planned breaks. So I'll try to be brief, although sometimes it's difficult. Uh, this is the fourth. This is the fourth of our uh, annual precision medicine, patient-driven precision medicine uh, conferences. And every year, we've had a keynote by individuals who really represent this notion that patients citizen scientists, people who have experienced disease directly or indirectly through their family, become activated in ways that can drive healthcare and biomedical science forward in ways that if we just waited for the healthcare system and for the scientific establishment to do on its own, it might not happen as fast as we would want. And I think back to our first keynote speaker, uh, Matt Might. Matt Might, who, when I first met him, Matt Might, who, when I first met him, had only been uh, known to those of us in the computer science nerd community as an expert in uh, computer languages and privacy, and also had been featured uh, in a New Yorker article about his son who had been the first diagnosed in the world with a um, mutation in a gene previously not associated with any human disease whatsoever. And Matt, uh, at the t by the time of the writing of the uh, New Yorker article, had been able to push forward the early exome sequencing of his child, which allowed the identif identification of the causative mutation and using transgressively social networks, Google AdWords, Twitter, to find, in the end, dozens of patients throughout the world who had the same characteristics as his child and who then ended up, for a large proportion, having, in fact, mutations in this disease. And so I already was thinking to myself at the time, how many fancily trained doctors do I know, physician scientists, who have been able to discover a new disease and then create a cohort? And then by the time I had invited him to our first um, annual meeting to g give a keynote, he was, being, he was able to tell how he had networked with a bunch of uh, scientists in glycosylation uh, biology and had come to the hypothesis that perhaps what was missing in his uh, child's brain was a small sugar uh, that was cleaved off of uh, a larger sugar and a uh, sugar polymer. And I saw him say this in front of the head of the, the then head of the FDA, the FDA commissioner. He said how, he described how he ordered this, um, even while he was looking for gene therapy at millions of dollars per person, he ordered on Amazon.com the um, sugar, made a milkshake out of it, drank it, did not die, and then uh, the next day uh, gave it to his child, who, by the way, had never cried. That was part of the syndrome. And this child not only uh, had the first tears ever, but also went on to uh, have much less seizures. He was having hundreds of seizures a day. and went down to just a few seizures a day. Matt then went on from this conference. He was seen by someone from the White House and became uh, a very important operative in the Obama White House on de uh, developing policies and infrastructure around precision medicine, both for the precision medicine initiative, now called All of Us, 
and for the uh, Million Veterans Program. And this individual who was trained in computer scientist and tenure, had a tenure track job as a computer scientist at University of Utah, in fact, a tenured job there, is now head of the new Institute for Precision Medicine at University of Alabama. So I think it's a remarkable, but I think telling story. And it's also remarkably not unique. Our second uh, keynote speaker was a woman who had been um, in the finance industry. And when she was told that her child had San Filippo disease after her child was six months old and was told, perhaps unkindly, but probably no differently than many others would have told, this was in, in Paris, in France, that she should go home and watch her child, spend quality time with the child while her child would, A, develop, then lose the milestones, and then die. Instead of accepting that, she started a gene therapy company which, and she came and gave us a, a talk about it in the middle of building up this company, which has now uh, gone through an IPO in France, and several individuals have been treated. And I could go on and on. But the point here is that the work towards precision medicine, and when I say precision medicine, what, what do I mean? Well, I, say, I speak as someone who was uh, one of the uh, authors along with uh, Susan Desmond Helmond and many others who wrote the Precision Medicine Report. Very simply, it's, it says that just looking at our patients with one data modality, just genomics, just epigenetics, just the clinical, each of them by, the, by their own are insufficient. And looking at our patients in a multi-axial way will give us a much better insight into these patients. And what, this, what I think this, we illustrate in this conference is that there are more ways than just uh, traditional biomedical, industrial, academic complex to move forward to uh, realizing this vision. I think we need this, this huge complex, but there's more that uh, we can do to move it forward. And through many of the speakers that you will hear today and through many of the panels, I hope you'll have an appreciation of how we're trying to bring this together. And speaking of bringing together, because we have in the past conferences talked about different aspects of the precision medicine enterprise, whether finding therapeutics or controlling your own data, this year our um, focus is something actually a little bit less focused, but probably just as important which is how do you bring all these different pieces together so we can actually have a unified whole. If you look at the business plans of different startups, they all address, many of them address different parts of it, but very few bring it all together. And in that spirit, I'd like to, uh, first of all, before I go further, I think it would be important to point out that the reason that we can uh, offer you this amazing uh, day and this, um, in this very nice venue, and are able to fly in the speakers and even give you some uh, nice food is because we have some very generous uh, sponsors who have uh, essentially underwritten the cost of this conference, they include Amazon Web Services, Verily, uh, Datavant, Novartis, and the NIH through supporting of our big data initiatives. So as I was saying, in speaking of bringing the pieces together, um, there are very few others who I could think of who bring together all the pieces, and there are many, as our Dean uh, George Daly. And he's done it in a way that actually recognizes, in, that recognizes how we have to embrace a larger social vision every time we do societally meaningful a science, and I remember well, 10, 15 years ago, I think, you know, hearing him on the radio arguing for the need uh, for better stem cell biology, for access to samples. And so he's continued that uh, thread in his uh, assumption of the dean, uh, deanship at the medical school here because there are a lot of the pieces present in 
the medical school, but we're a tough bunch, and his job has been to bring it together. And perhaps he'll touch on that now. So thank you very much, Dean Daly. Looking forward to hearing your remarks. A tough bunch. <laughs> no. Not at all. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. Listen, it's great to be here uh, to give a little perspective on the day. Uh, welcome, everyone. So great to see so many folks here. We've got Gil Oman right up front who knows a thing or two about precision medicine. Great to have you here. Um, so welcome to the fourth annual Precision Medicine Conference at uh, Harvard Medical School. Every year, this program showcases the, uh, the swiftness uh, in which we're approaching this new, new area. How many strides forward um, the community has taken towards a shared goal of providing truly integrated, data-driven, and ultimately effective medical care for people. You know, biomedical knowledge is accruing so rapidly uh, at such vast uh, scales that it really transcends the ability of any human mind to actually comprehend it. And so we've got to come up with new strategies for managing the data. Um, and that means that the biomedical research enterprise is becoming ever more dependent uh, upon the quantitative, computational, um, and systems approaches that are going to make sense of the data that we're collecting and are go going to allow us to translate it into the useful diagnostic and therapeutic strategies. I'm living this right now. My sister uh, has just gone through major cardiac surgery at the Brigham and spending a week in the cardiac surgical intensive care unit. And the volume of monitoring that um, has gone on in just her case is just truly extraordinary. And yet, I'm sitting at the bedside realizing um, just how little of that information we're taking advantage of. Um, and the fact that we're still making cognitive mistakes in patient management, mistakes that I think will be corrected and supported by the increased use of computational strategies for supporting uh, healthcare. So as Dean of Harvard Medical School, I have to say, I believe very strongly that we need to invest in major ways in the areas that I've talked about in computation and systems and the like, uh, because ultimately that's going to transform healthcare. So I have announced, uh, and it's not just because Zach has introduced me, but we at HMS are going to be investing considerable resources to strengthen our Department of Biomedical Informatics, which Zach chairs, and the Department of Systems Biology, which is now very ably led by uh, Professor Galit Lahav. Both departments provide a foundation for the sort of complex biological inquiry that, that you're all going to be discussing today. Also, I want to point out that just this month, we launched the Harvard-MIT Center for regulatory science, which is spearheaded by the systems pharmacology professor, Peter Sorger. And this uh, Harvard Center for Regulatory Science was formed through a memorandum of understanding with the FDA. And the center aims to transform how regulatory science is conducted um, by applying modern data science quantitative approaches to drug discovery, validation, and evaluation. The center is a collaborative forum uh, where s researchers now from many Boston biomedical institutions, not just Harvard and MIT, as well as representatives from the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industries, can work together with the FDA on innovative strategies for the effective development and evaluation of new therapeutic products. On that same day, just a few weeks ago, when we launched the Center for Regulatory Science, we also launched the National Cancer Institute Center for Cancer Systems Pharmacology at uh, Harvard Medical School. Now, the new Center for Systems uh, 
will galvanize the development of precision targeted therapies for cancer uh, by giving patients the most effective drug or drug combinations for their specific tumor while we hope minimizing side effects. And it is in, certainly in the cancer space where I think we've made the most progress to date on targeted therapies and precision medicine, but we want to see that expanded to many different areas of medicine. So it does involve computational systems biology approaches. Um, meanwhile, with Zach's group, uh, this spring we launched an advanced integrated science course, uh, part of our new Harvard Medical School curriculum. Uh, this is for third year medical students and it focuses on computationally enabled medicine. Now that month long unit turned out was the most popular course by far of the eight new uh, advanced integrated science courses. Um, and what I think that's telling us is that there is an enormous appetite among the medical students and also a recognition of the importance of computation of the future of medicine. Uh, Another lesson we've learned recently from surveying the community, uh, we conducted a survey of almost 900 laboratories across the Harvard medical community. And we found out that there was a, dr a very dramatic enthusiasm among the faculty for more approaches to developing therapeutics. So consequently, I've put together and has been working for the last year, a task force of professors led by Nathaniel Gray, Tim Mitchison, to formulate rec uh, recommendations on how we can change the community uh, so that the entire community can more effectively translate the basic science for which we're famous into more impactful therapeutics. And so this fall, we're gonna be rolling out something formally known as the, uh, the Harvard Therapeutics Initiative. I mean, the point is, we're not gonna make major changes in 21st century medicine without embracing data-driven science as the core of medical practice. And that's not just in diagnostics, but it will be across the range of therapeutic areas as well. And I think Zach pointed out, and I wanna highlight, the incredibly important contributions of patients, patient advocates, so-called citizen scientists, in being able to give us, the medical community, access to their healthcare records, bringing together communities so that we can leverage the data and together be able to drive healthcare forward. I'm very, very impressed with many of the speakers, as Zach has mentioned. Um, these are patient advocates, uh, the citizen scientists who will be teaching us some of those important lessons. We have Greg Simon here, president of the Biden uh, cancer Initiative, himself a survivor of CLL. Here's someone who spent more than a decade working to streamline cancer clinical trials uh, to speed the translation of oncologic treatments from bench to bedside, and then before receiving his own diagnosis and transforming his newfound personal motivation into yet more passion for spurring the field along. From the vantage point of someone firmly rooted in academia, I am inspired by Greg's ability to convene partners and combine data sets from across sectors that are traditionally siloed, and that has enabled more rapid scientific and clinical discovery. We also have uh, Amy Abernathy, who's the chief medical officer, chief scientific officer, the senior vice president of oncology at Flatiron Health. Amy combines computational and human curatorial efforts to extract meaningful relationships within huge data sets that span multiple cancer types. For more than a decade, Amy has led the development of clinical data aggregation systems that spur advancements in cancer care, including personalized medicine outcomes research, cancer care quality monitoring, and scientific discovery. Another speaker is Gerald Cox, who is an instructor in pediatrics here at our own Boston Children's Hospital and he's chief medical officer at Editas Medicine. Now, uh, he serves as a model for pursuing super precise uh, medicine, uh, Editas and the applications of CRISPR, uh, which I think is 
holding a huge amount of promise for transforming the future of therapeutics. We have Paul Fergese, who is the head of health informatics at Verily, the Google Life Sciences company, who is leading efforts to increase data acquisition during routine clinical care, so to improve the quality of care through information technology by predicting better outcomes, minimizing adverse events, identifying which therapies are likely to be the most beneficial for individual patients, the heart of this approach to precision medicine. Now, I wasn't dean at the time, but I do get to take a little bit of credit <laughs> for the fact and take pride in the fact that Paul uh, Verghese completed our Master's of Biomedical Informatics program in 2016, was a clinical informatics fellow at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and that program in biomedical informatics is, I think, once again, a major way that Harvard Medical School can really enrich the pipeline of folks using this important technology for the service of medicine. And we also have Keith Dunleavy here, who's another Harvard Medical School alum, who now, as the CEO of Innovalon, is enabling better and more effective and cost-effective care by integrating clinical data from an incredible array of resources and hosting the information on secure cloud-based platforms where it can be analyzed. So we're talking about data pertaining to nearly one million physicians in that, in that accounting. A half million clinical facilities, 243 million Americans, and more than 38 billion medical events. So we're starting to talk about the kind of data sets that allow us to use the power of machine learning to identify patterns that the human brain can't recognize. This is an unmatched resource. So I could list every speaker today. I, it's a remarkable lineup. I'm envious of you. I'm only going to be able to spend some time here this morning. But uh, I'll stop there so that we can hear from them directly. I want to thank all of you for your interest. I want to thank Zach for his leadership. And I very, very much look forward to Harvard Medical School playing a major role in the future of precision medicine. Thank you, Zach. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Daly. So I'm very proud to say that we're batting 1,000, which is every single one, one of our keynote speakers, including this one, does not, unless they've been very secretive about it, have an MD. <laughs> and, and so as far as I can tell, Greg Simon has a degree in law at the University of Washington, but no MD. And, and I don't fully understand, actually, how he came to it, but he became quite interested in patient empowerment and showed with his own career, way before his own diagnosis, immense dissatisfaction with the way we were advancing uh, discovery research. And this was very evident in his foundational work with uh, Faster Cures and the uh, Milken Foundation. And it was very evident in his own work in the industry, the pharmaceutical industry, where he was not just another pretty face at Pfizer, but he was actually working on patient advocacy there, which at the time that he was doing it was not the um, sure uh, uh, crowd pleaser that it is today. Then of course, uh, he had his, his own diagnosis and as far as I can tell, it has, all it did was to just continue his trajectory in patient empowerment and allowed him to be even more articulate about his dissatisfaction with many things that may scare a number of us. I've read in preparing for this introduction, I've read words about NIH funding that scared the heck out of me. Um, and I've seen uh, also some issues he's had with uh, the way industry handles innovation. But overall, he brings to the table a sort of integrative, patient-focused energy. And I think that perhaps no better evidence of that 
comes from his trajectory from being the head of the uh, task force at the, at the White House on cancer to his now leadership of the uh, Biden Cancer Initiative, where literally dozens of youth <coughs> projects are being uh, spun up just in the, I think, in the uh, course of the past year. And most of it is actually not just handing out money. In fact, that, I would say probably that's the minority of it. Minority of it. Most of it, as from my uh, 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 perspective of a bit of a remove, seems to me bringing together, convening together people who are truly passionate about this and willing to invest their own resources to advance uh, research in this area. And so, without further ado, I just want to recognize uh, our speaker's leadership in patient-driven precision medicine, specifically in the area of cancer. And I look forward to hearing his remarks. I want to say for those of you who care about such things, if you want to tweet about us, it's hashtag PM18HMS. For those of you who haven't had enough coffee, PM, precision medicine, 18, our year, HMS, a fine institution we uh, happen to reside at. So, Greg, thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. <coughs> Put down the tools of my trade here. A book, a watch, a phone. <coughs> I consider it a real honor to be asked to talk to a group like this. I usually assume that the other people who could have been here are either out of the country or maybe in jail. Um, <laughs> because the trajectory of my career basically involved um, two things. Answering my phone and hiring really great people so I can go out and do things like this. Um, literally, and this is what I tell millennials all the time, answer your phone. Opportunity does not text. Um, <clears throat> when I was, uh, when I was uh, in my own business, I answered my phone one day, and it was a client of mine who had multiple myeloma, and he said, I want to introduce you to Mike Milken, who wants someone to start a nonprofit in Washington. And I said, Richard, I, I have a job. I have a company. He said, no, no, I mean, I, I know, but he wanted somebody who really knew Washington, and that's you. And I thought you'd at least like to meet him. And I said, well, sure, I'd like to meet him. So he said, great, here he is. And he had him on hold. Um, <laughs> and I'm in my car waiting for my kids to get off of a school trip at Union Station. And so I find myself on the phone with talking to one of the giants of 20th century finance who started a whole revolution in the way we do foundations and research. And within two or three months, I had started Faster Cures with him, left my business Six years later, my phone rings, and it's the CEO of Pfizer saying, I'd like you to come help Pfizer do for patients what you're doing at Faster Cures. Um, fast forward, I went to a conference in Sweden. I sat next to a guy I didn't like very much because somebody had moved my book from the person I wanted to visit with to the corner, and I thought, "Who? I'm talking to Jabba the Hutt. Um, and he says, I've got an idea for you. The next time you're in New York, let me know. So I let him know. And because he was a jerk, he didn't respond. And um, I, I was standing in Grand Central having been stood up for a coffee date with a friend of mine who was in town. And my phone rings. So I answered it. And a guy said, you don't know me. I heard you speak five years ago at Faster Cures. The guy you sat next to in Sweden gave me your number. I've been looking for you. But I missed where you went after you left Pfizer because I took a sabbatical. And he said, I want to tell you about my company. And I said, well, OK, uh, where are you? And he says, I'm in Grand Central. I said, well, so am I. Go figure. How does a kid from Arkansas end up in Grand Central? Anyway, um, so I said, well, I'll come up. And so I went up. And he talked to me about crowdfunding and the Jobs Act and how impact on health if we allow people to actually invest in the diseases they care about by letting them invest in startup private companies, which was illegal since 1974, but was now going to be legal. And after an hour of a fascinating discussion of the history of the American economy since World War II, 
and the rise of the 1%, I said, well, this is really cool. Why am I here? He says, you're the CEO. <clears throat> and I said, well, yes, I am. And then I went home and explained that to my wife because I was living in Washington. And this was a job in New York. So I, uh, the other time I answered my phone, I was walking down the street in New York. I had just finished six months of chemo. And I get a call. And this young kid said, Joe Biden wants to meet with you in the morning to talk about the cancer moonshot. And I said, oh, <clears throat> uh, well, I'm in New York. And uh, I have a meeting tomorrow morning with my leukemia doctor. And he said, oh, no problem. Uh, we'll set it for the next week. <clears throat> so I hung up and I said to myself, what am I, stupid? And so I called my leukemia doctor. It's like 9 o'clock at night. But we're friends. He, he's a cellist. I'm a cellist. Uh, I had leukemia. He's a leukemia doctor. We had a lot in common. Uh, and uh, I said, uh, Marty, I'm supposed to, I just got this call to go talk to Joe Biden about running the cancer moonshot task force, but I have an appointment with you tomorrow morning. And he said, what are you, stupid? <laughs> go. You can see me anytime. So I did. I did. And I got the job. And here I am. Uh, answer your phone. Uh, I could never have designed the career I've had. I'm a very lucky person. Um, so that's not what I'm here to talk to you about, obviously. Uh, but first, and I, I apologize if people have heard me speak before because I have not changed my mind about anything, okay? <laughs> this is not one of those speeches where I go, you know, a year ago I said this, but it's not that way. It's like Trump said, well, you know, I might be wrong in a year, but I'll come up with an excuse. Um, <laughs> My problem is I have been on a tear since college against positivism. How many of you know what the positivist movement was? We're at Harvard, right? Okay, come on. I'm from Arkansas. I'm sure you learned this. You just don't remember it. August Comte in the 1700s decided that we needed to divide humans into disciplines, which you all have at the end of your degree. And those disciplines allow us to study people in slices like psychology, physiology, biology, chemistry, and all of the subdivisions that we've gone in crazy with. And the idea was not to divide us. The idea was to study us more deeply and then reunite us. Guess what? We never reunite us. And that was why I was on a tear in college, because I did a huge paper comparing the psychology personality theorists and the philosophers of history and pointing out that you cannot understand the differences among them if you don't treat psychology and history as one discipline. Your view of history depends on your view of how we act, and your view of psychology depends on the importance of history. To Freud, history was everything. To Skinner, it was nothing. To the existentialist, it was part of the story but not deterministic. You can't understand philosophers of history unless you realize Toynbee thought we just react to the environment and other people, going back to Voltaire, think we act out of motive. Most of us think we act out of motive, but you'd be surprised how many people say, no, you're just an amoeba and you get stimulated and you do something. So why am I bringing all that up? Because it's our problem today that we never put things back together. We never look at the whole person. And part of looking at the whole person is that we have to address, when I'm talking to you about precision medicine, the first thing I want to talk about is you. Specifically, your elephant. Okay? Now, you may not know you have an elephant, but you do. When, when I look out and see 1,000 of you, I see 2,000 of you because you're each riding an elephant, according to Jonathan Haidt, the neuroscientist, behavior, behavioral psychologist, who says we're all riding an elephant that represents our subconscious. And we think we're in charge. You're not in charge. The elephant's in charge. And you know this. You know you have confirmation bias. You know you have political bias. You know you've thought some things your whole life and never rethought them. You know you read things that, sac that, that, that prove you're right. And you don't read things that don't prove you're right. I put Fox News and all the crazy right-wing stuff on my news alert. It gets me so mad before breakfast, I feel like the Red Queen. I, I'm supposed to be believing three impossible things before I get out of bed because I'm reading this, these crazy conspiracy theorists. But guess what? 
millions of your neighbors are reading this and believe it. So I, I'm now injecting myself with this as a science experiment. But here's the problem. We're not alone. That little voice that you've grown up with in your head that says, I don't like this guy, or is this just going to be about jokes? The little voice that says, you know, I have never liked people who look like that, or I've never liked people who talk like that. That's not your conscious mind. That's your subconscious mind, and you've had it your whole life. Here's the good news. It's now represented in the physical world by your phone. People now check their phone the way they used to check the little voice in their head, right? Except for guys, every six seconds is still about sex, but <clears throat> and every six weeks for women, but the... the uh, that's a marriage joke. Um, but the, the, the phone, career over, <laughs> the phone is now what we use to distract ourselves from everybody else to confirm our own biases, right? So I have an experiment for you. I want you to take your phone out and hand it to the person behind you for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> she's shaking, no, she's not doing it. Hand your phone to the person behind you for 30 minutes to prove to me you can listen and not be distracted for 30 minutes. <laughs> Go ahead and make friends. Is your phone muted? Is it muted? No, it's recording. Oh. <laughs> Okay, that's good. This is a success already, okay. Now, interestingly, there are, there are two or three groups that do this really well, nurses and caregivers, because they trust people and people trust them. I, how many of you refuse to do it? Okay, not bad, not bad. Um, I was at a CRISPR conference, and I asked them to do this, and they totally refused. Everybody refused. And I said, let me get this straight. You don't trust the person behind you with your phone for 30 minutes. The person in front of you doesn't trust you with their phone for 30 minutes. But you want all of us to trust you with our germline so you can manipulate it and you won't even loan your phone. <laughs> so, so bear with me, okay? The first thing I want to do is be able to get into your head because I take this role very seriously. I really do. I am incredibly honored to be able to do this because it lets me give my opinion, lets me give some of Joe Biden's opinions about where we're going in cancer. But when I talk about holistic approach to people, it's also about where we are as a society because I find it increasingly difficult to talk about the cutting edge of health without talking about the bleeding edge of health. And we have to, in these conversations among the elite, and we're the elite, we need to understand where we are before we can talk about where we're going. So where are we? Well, we know that the single biggest determinant of who survives cancer <clears throat> is who has insurance. Where are we on that? After all the decades from World War II to now, we finally had a health care bill that insured people who were having trouble getting insurance because they had bad employers, they had pre-existing conditions, they were a little too wealthy for Medicaid, a little too young for Medicare. They had job lock because they couldn't move jobs because they'd lose their insurance and their kid has asthma, they'll never get it again. And I read the other day an article by a conservative woman who said the only pre-existing condition we need to get rid of is Obamacare. That's where we are. We're willing to put 10 million people out of insurance, knowing that thousands of them will die from preventable cancers that won't be caught. That's one place where we are. The second place where we are, and I, I apologize in advance for bringing this up, but I find it difficult to talk about health without talking about it. We just gave 2,300 children a rare disease. We just gave 2,300 children a rare disease by traumatizing them by ripping them from their families. And I, don't, I was a Republican growing up. I haven't been a liberal Democrat my whole life. I'm from the South. I'm from the Trump country. 
But I don't care who you are. There are rare diseases smaller than that cohort that are going to now be traumatized the rest of their lives because trauma changes your brain. We know this from soldiers, but we know it in children too. It changes your brain. And most of those children are still separated from their parents. If you have a child, separate them from you and put them in a dark room somewhere for a week and see how they feel with no contact with you. We have to recognize where we are. And where we are is very different than where we've been in the past. You know, I don't sleep well the night before I give a speech because I always worry that this will be the day I stand up and don't have anything to say. So I was watching Seabiscuit last night. And you remember Seabiscuit was in the Depression. And all through the movie, they tie what was happening to the horse to what was happening to people. And what they were showing was that for the first time in many of their lives, Roosevelt and the New Deal and the Works Association, the, work, the Public Works Association that built bridges and buildings and dams, it wasn't about the buildings and the dams. It was about, and I quote, somebody cared about you for the first time. Somebody cared about you for the first time. When we build the Golden Gate, when we build the New York subway, when we build the Hoover Dam, it's not about the technology. It says we care about each other as a society. We want to be able to move around. We want to be able to generate power cleanly. We want to be able to get people to jobs they need to get to across the bay. It was audacious to build the New York subway. It was audacious to build the Golden Gate. Where is that? If we can't build, the, the equivalent today is not a building. The equivalent today is health care. The audacious building of a health care system is what we are not doing. And that is something that we have to do, and you have to be part of it. Even if you're at the cutting edge, you will be like a cartoon character that runs off the cliff and realizes too late there's nothing under him. If we let the entire healthcare system fall because politics are just too messy, while we're working on precision medicine because that's clean and straightforward. End of that. But I think it's important for us to think about it. So I want to talk about one organization that puts patients first, bear name by else the cancer cell. Cancer cells are totally devoted to putting the patient first. They are obsessed with the patient. They harness the blood supply. They harness the nervous system. They harvest the tissue system. They use the healthy cells around them as human shields to keep them safe from radiation and chemicals and the blood-brain barrier. Cancer puts people first. It is not distracted by IP. It is not distracted by tenure. It is not distracted by publications. It puts people first. And it is single-minded, and it will do whatever it has to do. It will build a 1,000 tunnels while we are building a wall. It will go all over the body while we're looking at the point of origin. We're constantly looking for the bank robber in the safe, and they've long ago left. Cancer is our model for how we should fight cancer, because cancer is completely undistracted and single-minded. <coughs> Can we say the same about our system of fighting disease, that we're undistracted and single-minded and totally focused on the patient? When I was at Pfizer, I realized that we had 150,000 people in clinical trials every year, and we never once talked to them. I go to dinner, and open table surveys me before dessert. I fly, and before I land, I get a survey about my flight. I devote my life to a clinical trial for a year and I don't even get a thank you letter? When I suggested maybe we should send thank you letters, people were like, oh wow, never thought of that. I'm like, how did your mother raise you? <laughs> we thank soldiers at every ball game who put their lives on the line for us. Clinical trial patients put their lives on the line for us. At their expense often, at their pain and suffering often, Thank you would be nice, but more importantly, how was it? So we gave them, we created the first in the industry, it's embarrassing to say it, feedback loop for patients to opt in to tell Pfizer what their experience was in the trial. 
Did you get good or better health care? You, would you do this again? Would you have a family member do it? Did you get the information you need? Do you know what happened in the trial? When I mentioned this to another person from another company, they were like, wow, we never thought of that. And I'm like, how can you not think of this? It happens in your life every day in every other place except the most important part of your life, which, of course, is your health. So, yes, it was a little frustrating that that was news. Let me put it that way. So, if we can mimic the cancer cell, we'll do a whole lot better than what we've been doing so far because cancer is way smarter than we are, knows more biology than we do, knows more escape routes than we can possibly block, which is why there was a great article in Nature a few years ago that said, compare the war on cancer to the war on terror. You bomb something and the survivors become more radical, not less radical. You attack the cancer viciously, it becomes more virulent, not less virulent. You cannot destroy it. You cannot eliminate it. What you do is you either spread it or you make it literally revert back to an earlier stage of its evolution to become more virulent what we as humans call our reptile brain. When you're in those stupid arguments or driver's rage, you literally are in a different part of your brain that's fight or flight. Cancer cells do that too, and they recruit the healthy cells to do the same thing. So yes, we can think that we're destroying cancer, but what we really want to do, the same with terrorism, is contain it. Is contain it. Keep it from spreading. It's the spreading that kills you. And yet, we've devoted decades to destroying it with the result that we haven't been spending decades figuring out metastasis until recently. So for the rest of my talk, I have several people I want to mention. One is Bill James, the baseball statistician. One is my Uncle Tom, who is as crazy as you might think if he's from Arkansas and I'm still calling him Uncle Tom. Uh, Tina Turner. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma, and then we'll have a big finish with uh, Jesus. <laughs> I'll leave it there. So I want to talk to you about three cancers as an example of where we are and where we're not. My cancer, I found out I had leukemia uh, from a physical. And I found out when I was getting off an airplane, instead of answering my phone, I made a call. And I talked to my doctor because I wanted the results of the physical before he closed the office. And he said... PSA is good, cholesterol is good, by the way, you have leukemia. Uh, what? Uh, by the way, you have leukemia. I said, well, you know, I went to public schools, but that's not how we use by the way. Uh, <laughs> it's like, by the way, you have a little lint on your coat, not by the way, you have 180,000 white cells. That's like, holy shit, you have 180,000 white cells, should have been the first thing out of his mouth. This was four days later. You know how long it takes to do a CBC, complete blood count? 20 minutes, 20 minutes at most. Somebody knew on Monday when I did the test that I had 180,000 white cells and nobody told me all week. I flew to San Francisco, different kind of leukemia, I could have died. I happen to have the slippery cell kind so it doesn't cause a blood clot when you fly, but it could have. The first two doctors I called, friends of mine, were freaked out that I had flown with that many white cells. Second cancer, my friend Alex got diagnosed with GBM the same time I got diagnosed with leukemia. She was only 40. I'm 66 now. Um, I'm supposed to be diagnosed with something. Uh, she's not. And I knew that she had roughly 18 months. Uh, helped her get into a clinical trial. She maintained a good quality of life. I was treated and finished 18 months after my diagnosis. She died 18 months after her diagnosis because we don't have a clue about GBM. There are outliers, there are people who've lived five years, but of the thousands and thousands of people, that's not the norm. Then my friend Bard, MIT graduate, started a company he sold to Cisco when he was in his 30s, made a ton of money, it was the first computer-based voicemail system. He discovered he had multiple myeloma, they gave him three years to live. He died three years later, in December. And he had money, he knew all about the disease, he was an MIT grad, he, he knew more about it than the doctors did. What happened? He funded his own clinical trial at Fred Hutchison Cancer Center, it never got started in a year and a half. He sent his bone marrow biopsy to Dana-Farber for a trial, they decided to pause the trial 
while they audit their data. He never got into it. He went to Sloan Kettering to get into a CAR-T trial, flew from Seattle with incredible back pain, gets there, and they say, when was your last chemo? He said, two weeks ago. They said, oh, that's too recent. You have to go back. Come see us in three more weeks. There's a phone for that. So he flew back to Seattle, flew back to New York. I visited him. The trial did not work. He went back to Seattle, and he had been fighting this fight for three years. He'd had a few successes, but generally he fell in the cracks of everything we know. And he was on Caring Bridge. And he finally said, you know, the pain quotient is crossing the line of the benefit quotient. So Washington State has a death with dignity law, which is wonderful. So they scheduled his departure. And his wife's last post said that her husband spent the last three months of his life doing his own personal moonshot to let the doctors try whatever they wanted to on him to see what happened. That got to me. I knew he was going to die. We had said our goodbyes. But the idea that the moonshot had inspired him to let them experiment on him was incredible. I don't know that I could have done that. So why do I bring these three stories up? My story shows how broken the basic healthcare system is that you let somebody go four days and not tell them they have leukemia. But I got perfect treatment down the street from my office, well insured, never got sick from the treatment, never got sick from the leukemia. That's the only person I know with that story. My friend Alex never had a chance. My friend Bard could have had a chance, but the way things worked out, he didn't. But the clinical trial system completely failed him at every level at the best institutions. So it's hard to be optimistic about the cutting edge when I'm still looking at the bleeding edge wondering, how is it they never got the trial started in a year and a half? How is it you can fly to New York and find out they have, a, have, to, have to ask you a question they could have asked you when you were home? So that causes a lot of consternation for me, which is where the moonshot comes in. When we started the Cancer Moonshot Task Force, I'm facing 20 agencies, and it all came down, because I'm a history major, it all came down to me to questions. What's the question? Is the question, do you need more money? Is the question, do you need uh, to expand your personnel in this program and that program? That's the question people are used to the government asking each other. That wasn't the question. The question was, where are you touching patients in their journey from prevention through survivorship and everything in between? And if you don't know the answer to that, go back and figure it out and come see me. And then figure out how you're going to double that, double the number of patients, cut the time in half, double the impact, double the scale, and work with another agency in this room you've never worked with before because you all have a role to play. And that included the National Endowment for the Arts, NASA, USDA, EPA, and the usual players, DOD, FDA, DOE, VA, NCI, NIH. But too often we think, oh, cancer, NCI. That's the positivist view. The real view is people learn more about survivorship from the arts than they do from JAMA. People learn more about medical research from Lorenzo's Oil, the movie, than they'll ever learn by talking to a scientist. There's kind of a vocabulary gap. So <clears throat> at the end of the day, they came back with really good ideas. I won't go into them all. You can look them up. But we ended up with 80 new initiatives, 20 inside the government, 60 outside the government, because people do this all the time. I want to work with the Cancer Moonshot. How can we partner with you? And I'd say, well, you can partner with us by telling us what you do now and then tell me how you're going to double it. And if you need partners, we'll help you find partners. We don't have money for you. We don't have regulatory shortcuts for you. But if you tell me what you want to do, we can command enough of an audience to find people to help you. And that's what we're doing also with the Biden Cancer Initiative. People call us all the time, how can we work with the Biden Cancer Initiative? And I tell them the same thing. Tell me how you want to double what you're doing, and I'll tell you if I can help you. I got an email just today. Somebody cured cancer in a stage one trial with 25 people. I get those once a week. They want to come see me and Joe Biden. 
And I'm going to write them back and say, you know what? If you did that, I'm the last person you need to spend time with. You need to go straight to the FDA. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Leave me out of it. I'm not going to lobby for you. I'm not going to advocate for you at the FDA. I'm not going to give you money. But if you've cured cancer in 25 people in a stage one trial, which I'm highly skeptical of, then you need to just do what you're supposed to do and do it fast. That's how you help us. But what we're trying to do, I, it has to pass the mother test. So my dad never understood what I did as a consultant, and I, I don't blame him. I didn't either. Um, but my mom says, so son, what do you do? And I say, well, we try to get people to share data more. You mean they're not doing that now? Uh, no. Uh, we're trying to get people to use standards in cancer like they do in other sciences so that you know how long the king's foot is. She said, you mean they don't have those? And I go, no, not really. Uh, we're trying to get clinical trials that are done with patients, not to patients, and where they are, not making them commute when they're deathly ill for hours. You mean they don't do that now? No. And I see my mom thinking, God, I raised an idiot. <laughs> He's working on stuff that I thought was already done. So finally I came up with the, I said, Mom, we're trying to build the cancer research and care system you think we already have. <laughs> and she, oh, okay, that's good. Now, my mom's 95 and on fewer medicines than I am, right? And my dad died at 91. I'm trying not to blow the family lineage here with my leukemia. I'm trying to, you know, get into my nines, so to speak. But that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build the cancer research and care system you think we already have. So... This is, people fight with me about data sharing. Oh, it's not going to be that useful. Oh, we're not going to learn that much. Oh, the important data gets shared, you know, at ASCO, at the big conferences. And I say, okay, let me tell you about my Uncle Tom. He's crazy. He's dead now, but he was crazy for his whole life. Never had a job. He had a car wreck when he was in his 20s, so he had a stiff leg. So in addition to being bald as an egg and having a stiff leg, he always started every sentence like this. Whoop. So he'd come over and he'd say, how you doing, Greg? And I'd say, I'm great, Uncle Tom. How are you doing? He'd go, whoop, I'm fine. Not making this up. He was a hoarder like you have never seen. TV couldn't hold this. He had everything, the toilet, the tub, the oven, the bed, stacked to the ceiling with papers. He would go out at night and find stuff and bring it home. He died. And we had to go through the house with a city dumpster, like 10 of them. And we went through garbage, garbage, garbage. Oh, my God. Here's my father's ticket home from the war on the Queen Mary. Garbage, garbage, garbage. Oh, my God. Here's a letter my grandfather wrote to every member of Congress in the 30s about how to end the Depression in the South by starting a program of subsidizing cotton purchases. Oh, my God. And here are all the answers he got from senators and congressmen. Garbage, garbage, garbage. My father's Colt 45 and a bag of bullets and his duffel bag where he dropped them when he came home from the war and nobody moved them for 70 years. I am from Arkansas. They don't move around much. My uncle was born and lived and died in that house. My mother mailed that to me, the gun, with the bullets. A bag of bullets that you could not mistake for anything else in a box through the mail in 2003. National security? You tell me. So why do I bring that up? Hospitals are hoarders like my Uncle Tom. Your data is born, lives, and dies inside their house. There's a lot of junk, and there's a lot of great stuff. Right? Women who survived ovarian cancer treatment better if they were on a beta blocker. That's not what they were looking for, but that's what they found. Hospitals hoard data. Doctors' offices hoard data. Researchers hoard data. Journals hoard data. And if a human being does it one at a time, we think they're crazy. If they do it as an institution, it's a policy. <laughs> it's our policy. Why are you hoarding all this data? Why don't you let it out for a walk? Well, there might be something valuable in there. Okay, I'll bring a dumpster and we'll go through it. 
No, 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 we'll go through it. When? Well, later. They don't go, they don't go through it. That's the whole tragedy. They don't go through it. Standards, Bill James, baseball. Knowing I'm a lifelong Yankee fan, Zach put me up in the home of the Red Sox at the Hotel Commonwealth, where every bottle of water has a Red Sox logo on it. I was like dehydrated when I woke up this morning. <laughs> so, didn't want to touch it. Um, so, baseball has more standards than cancer, right? They have come up with so many ways to measure things. It's like the new Yankee rookie, Glaber Torres, is the first rookie who is 20 years and nine months old to hit three doubles in a week, you know, in the last 50 years against three different pitchers, one of whom was left-handed. I mean, they track all this stuff, and they have ways of measuring if you were replaced, how many runs would that mean, pro or con? They even measure your path to the ball if you're a defense person. If you're an outfielder, they measure the efficiency of your path to the ball. Now, imagine in cancer if we could measure our efficiency of our path to a breakthrough. First, that scares a lot of grantees to death because they know how inefficient science is. Can we do better? Of course we can do better. But here's the other thing that combines data sharing and data standards. In baseball, if you know how one player is doing, you know how one player is doing. You don't know how he fits into the average. If you know how the whole team is doing, you know how the whole team is doing, but you don't know how they fit into the league. So you have to measure the whole league in the same way to figure out who's where. You can't do that without standards. And yet in cancer, we don't have standards for checkpoint inhibitor assays for immune response. We are just now starting to do standards for tumor mutational burden and other aspects of immunotherapy that are really critical. We're just now getting standards for digital pathology or for pathology. Hundreds of years after we've started doing pathology, we still don't have a standard for Mayo and Sloan Kettering to write the same report the same way. And we wonder what is the role of the patient? Well, there are three roles of the patient. One, know them by sharing their data and understanding their data. Two, respect them by having a standard if you're going to cut them and biopsy them, for Christ's sake, have a standard on how you examine it and describe it and how you diagnose it. And third, include them. Clinical trials are done to them, as I mentioned, because we seldom involve patients in the design of the trial. Atul Gawande, book Being Mortal, says, start with asking the patient, how do you want the rest of your life to go? Not, do you want this intervention or that intervention? What do you want your life to be? The same with clinical trials. What's an endpoint that matters to you? I have glaucoma. I looked up clini uh, clinical trials because I have normal pressure glaucoma, which is difficult to treat. One of the clinical trials was going to do a spinal tap twice a year. I thought, whoa, first, I'm a drummer. Spinal tap is a bad memory. <laughs> Secondly, I'm not going to volunteer to do a spinal tap for my glaucoma when there are 12 eye drops and two laser surgeries that I could do first. Somebody thought that up on a Friday night after too many drinks. So at the Biden Initiative, we're, trying to, we're working with NIST to develop standards around immunotherapy assays. We're convening the people who already have data sharing networks, and there aren't that many. They fit on a few slides. To bring them in and say, if you can share in your group, can you share with among your group? And why not? And believe me, if Joe Biden's in the room, and you ask why not, and they, they say, it's our data, it could be valuable, it's too hard technically, it's a bad meeting. You don't want to do that. The head of Epic asked him, why do you even want your medical record? I lean back. I've worked for two vice presidents, and I know when to lean back. And I don't even want to work for a president. And Biden looked at her and said, none of your business. It's the right answer. It's the simple right answer. None of your business. They're my records. Clinical trials, the, we fight about that. Do we need more people in clinical trials? If you're a big doctor at a big institution with big trials, no. You get everything you need because people are dying to get in, literally. 
But what about if you're in Mobile? What about if you're in my hometown in Blyville, Arkansas, near Memphis? The community oncologists treat most people, 80 to 90% of people, to say to them, you need to put more people in clinical trials. And by the way, that means you should hire a clinical trial nurse and you should hire clinical trial trialists who know how to do all that. That's not helpful. That's why Google Health failed. They came up with the big thing and step one was, enter your medical data into our chart. <laughs> uh, okay, where is my medical data? How do I get it? And do I have to copy it from a piece of paper or can I cut and paste? Boom, crash, burn, because you cannot put the burden on the patient and you cannot put the burden on the community oncologist. So we're starting an initiative to work with the big guys, to work with the community oncologist to provide the people and the training, to provide the resources to do a trial in the community. Why? <clears throat> My friend Alex commuted from New York to here at Dana-Farber for a clinical trial in the last months of her life with two young children at home. Now, what are they possibly doing at the wonderful institution of Dana-Farber that they couldn't have trained someone to do at Sloan Kettering 40 blocks from her house? Nothing. And by, I guarantee you, somebody from Boston was commuting to New York. Well, if you live in Blyville, Arkansas, you're commuting three hours round trip just to get a shot in Memphis. You're commuting farther than that if you want to be in a clinical trial to a big city. This isn't the way to run a system. This is the way we've always done it, but that's not the way to run the system. So when I say we're trying to create the cancer system you think we already have, it's worse than you would ever imagine if you're on the patient side of the equation. <clears throat> so that gets me to Tina Turner. Precision medicine, I'm begging you. What's love got to do with it? Do not, please, do not fall in love with precision medicine. Why? We overlook the faults of people when we fall in love. We overlook the challenges to the relationship. We defend everything at all costs. Confirmation bias gets worse, not better. We lose objectivity. Do not fall in love with precision medicine. Treat it as the enemy. Try to break it. Try to stress it. When somebody says, oh, I think this is where we can go, say, great, let me see if I can break it. A whole group of tra transfer people started at Yale to create a new way of licensing things out from universities because they fail 40% of the time because of confirmation bias. And what they did was they, they go in, they get the asset from the dad and the mom, and they say, we're taking your asset away, and we give it to people who try to break it, who hate it, and if they can't break it, then we license it to pharma or biotech because it's been de-risked. That's really not a word, but I have to use it. It's been de-risked because people who do license straight out of universities, it fails 40% of the time. So that's the kind of thinking we need to have. That's what I mean by don't fall in love. I looked up the cancer march in 1996. You know what everybody was in love with then? Combinatorial chemistry. And then we fell in love with monoclonal antibodies. And then now we're falling in love with immunotherapy, which is killing some people and saving some people. It's got a long way to go. Now we're falling in love with precision medicine, the right drug for the right person at the right time. That's great, but don't believe it until you see it. Don't think it's there and see it because you love it. Challenge it at every stage of the game. Now, there are other critics out there like Vinay Prasad at Oregon Health University who was a critic of the moonshot. He's a critic of immunotherapy. He's a critic of precision medicine. He's just not very nice about it, or he would be here. Um, and I read those criticisms, and I go, you know, it's, it's not enough to say this will never work. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying don't fall in love with it. Be skeptical. Unfortunately, scientists are the first per persons to jump to a conclusion. I don't know any scientist that I ask in a question of who doesn't have an immediate answer when they should say, I don't know, but I think that's not what they say. They're almost as bad as surgeons. No offense. <laughs> um, so here's the other issue we have to deal with with precision medicine. And I'm this is my final chapter, so think of some questions or objections. 
the, the wheel of scientific discovery exists inside the wheel of the healthcare system. I already told you what I think our problems are in the big healthcare system at a grand level, but there's another problem. The right drug for the right person at the right time at the right price? Are we dealing with that? Not very well. Why? Because the system can't fix that. This system is based on the wrong organizing principle <clears throat> to have a rational pricing system. None, none of the solutions for pricing will work that you've heard. Negotiations with Medicare, they have to buy the drug. If it's approved by the FDA, they're required to buy the drug. There's a limit to their negotiating ability. Canada, please. Other, raising prices in other countries, which was Trump's idea, we'll raise prices on them. That'll lower prices here. No, that's not going to work. Why isn't it going to work? It's because our system is set up with the wrong organizing principle. Health is an asset, but that's not how it's organized. It's organized as a cost. What's the difference, you might ask? In the 70s, oral was a cost. When it went up, everybody yelled and screamed. Today, oral is organized as an asset. Every time it goes up, people rejoice. It goes down, people get upset. Why? Because they own it. They own it. How can they own it? Well, in the 70s, you couldn't. Today, you can trade it like anything else, like pork bellies, and that brings the prices down when you have a vibrant market to trade things, and farmers know this. Nobody sells wheat when they harvest it. They sell it the year before. And they take the risk it might be worth more, but the buyer takes the risk it might be worth less. It's a futures market because you're setting a price in the future today. Why won't that work in health? It will, but we don't organize it that way. We still think of health as a cost, when in fact it is the most important asset class, more important than agriculture, more important than energy. But if we keep acting like it's a cost and we're dividing up the cost between the insurance companies, the PBMs, and the pharma companies, and the patient has no economic power, no choice, in cancer, no hope, 75% of the first treatments fail, but you have to pay for it. If we don't change the organizing principle of health from a cost to an asset, no one will afford precision medicine. No one will afford CAR T therapy. This is me talking, not Joe Biden. The patient copay for cancer treatments should be zero. Zero. Let the health companies, the insurance companies, and the pharma companies without the PBMs renegotiate their arrangement as economic players, not as greedy drug makers and greedy insurance companies. Look at the, look at the debate around diagnostics in uh, foundation medicine and uh, all that. The payers delay paying for these tests, even though they can be shown to prove, they can be proven to help some people, that you have to pay for the test, and otherwise people won't do it, and they miss their chance. So here's the problem. The insurance companies over here are saying, I have to pay for this now. I don't get the benefit of saving that life over the next 20 years because I have nowhere to get that benefit. They're going to move to another company. The drug company says, I have a treatment that you just take once. I need to get all the money now. So what do these two things have in common? They both need a place to hedge their liabilities today over time and to get their future gains today. That's what's called a futures market. That's how it works. So if you're an insurance company, why don't you invest with the drug company in the phase three trial in exchange for a long-term contract at a better price? and pharma gets money up front that saves them the cost of capital for expensive phase three trials in exchange for a guaranteed revenue stream over time. It doesn't all have to be a cash flow deal. No company in America does cash flow. Everybody borrows money. Everybody thinks in the future except the healthcare system. So if we don't fix that wheel, all the good work you're doing in this wheel is going to get lost because people won't be able to afford it especially going back to the beginning, if we kick 10 million people off insurance who are the neediest among us, who can't get on Medicaid, then we're just making it even harder
for them to be able to afford a treatment for which there is no other option. So that brings up Yo-Yo Ma. <clears throat> I met Yo-Yo Ma by chance, and we became friends. And I would see him when he came to Washington to play. And he told me something I want to tell you. Practice, everybody thinks practice makes perfect. You've heard that, right? That's not true. Practice makes permanent. Only perfect practice makes perfect. When I practice a hard piece, I don't like practicing the hard part. I like practicing the pretty part, the easy part. Guess what? If I just practice the whole piece and I don't give the hard part more attention, I never learn it. Something else Yo-Yo Ma said was that amateurs practice until they get it right. That's me. Professionals practice until they cannot get it wrong. That's you. That has to be you. But you can't get there if you're not practicing perfectly. And all these issues I'm talking to you about, data standards, sharing data, better clinical trials, this is all about changing practice that we have inherited from generations ago that don't work today. Those were before you could even Xerox a piece of paper, so yeah, they didn't share data. But today, with the push of a button, you can share it to the world, but you wait till ASCO, because you get more press. I was at ASCO, and the person next to me was talking about this new treatment for multiple myeloma in a trial for people who'd failed every other treatment, and my friend had just died. And I thought, Jesus Christ, is he going to be the last person to die from multiple myeloma in that condition? Is he the last guy to get polio, so to speak? We need to up our game, and that means practicing perfectly, but only you know what you're doing that you've never thought about because your elephant keeps going there. Get off of the elephant. And lastly, I was walking through Dover, Vermont last August on a vacation, little bitty town, not much longer than this hall, and their church was letting out. And the sign said, cast your net to the other side. Who knows what that means? refers to. We are at Harvard, aren't we? Nobody read the Bible as a child? I used to remember, I had the Bible memorized when I was a kid. I got over it, but it was, it, <laughs> cast your net to the other side. So Jesus takes the apostles fishing and they're not getting anything because they go to the same place they always go. And he says in that metaphorical frustrating way he had, Cast your net to the other side and you will find riches beyond compare. So they do. And they get so many fish they can't pull up the net. What's the other side? It's the patient. If you're a doctor, change seats the next time they come in. You sit on the paper on the, on the bench. If you're in the hospital, you lie down, put a needle in your arm at four in the morning every day, and then ask, What's the patient's role in medical care? If you're a researcher and you've never met the patient who has the disease you're working on, get out of your chair and go to the other side and get to know them. When you ask the question, what is the role of patients in the future of medicine? It is to be understood. And to be understood, we all have to cast ourselves to their side of the bed. And that is not how we have learned to practice. So I beg you, don't fall in love with the whiz-bangness of precision medicine. If you want to fall in love with something, fall in love with the people you're trying to help. See the world from their perspective and ask, if I do all this, can they afford it? If I do all this, will they have the insurance to get the test? If I do all this, will it help somebody who otherwise would die in a small town because they didn't have access to Boston or New York? That's to me, the real meaning of putting patients in the center of what we're doing is to cast our minds to their side of the equation and everything will follow from that. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very impressive, not you. That was very impressive. <laughs> but what's very impressive is normally I have to buy you some time by asking a question, and already someone's in, uh, lined up in front. 
to give them a, to give a, a question. So first of all, Greg, that was, that was actually phenomenally Thank you. instructive. Oh, by the way, can you put the other slide up with some information? There we go. Nice. Self-explanatory. Nice. Gil. Greg, it's a powerful set of many messages, beautifully delivered. Thank you. There is one more topic I'm sure you have strong views about, which is preventing cancers. You know, we're all obsessed in medicine with treating after the harm is already well launched. And we have in this whole society very little attention to prevention, whether it's in health or in many, many other problems of our society. But there is a strategy that combines multiple avenues for ex reducing exposures, enhancing healthful behaviors, developing drugs and nutritional schemes that actually reduce development of cancers. Yes. Is this a big part of the agenda? And if it isn't, what should be done to make it so? It actually is a part of our agenda. We just, uh, we, we launched three work groups. Our MO is to use our advisors and our board, because we're, we're a small organization, we don't give out money. We're uh, seven people and we're 10 at the moment because of interns. Our MO is to use really bright people to help us figure out what's working and then scale it. So our first three working groups are data sharing, data standards, and clinical trial changes, including pediatric clinical trials, where we're looking at some really big ideas on how to make that better. We just added prevention, patient navigation, and access to medicines. Here's the thing about prevention. There's the behavior that we all know is hard to change, took 50 years to change smoking, overeating and drinking need to be next, but it's really hard to understand why people don't take vaccines that we know prevent cancer. The HPV vaccine. There are people now working on a BRCA gene repair vaccine. There's a hepatitis B vaccine that's related to some cancers. The U.S. has an abysmal rate of taking up HPV vaccine because we're getting less, well, let me just say it in English, we're getting stupid. We're arguing about the role of vaccines in mumps and measles and chickenpox and parents are here HPV vaccine, they think sex. I think cancer. That message has got to change. We've got to stop having a war on science because if we can't do the simple prevention measures, how are we ever gonna do the hard ones in terms of behavior and diet and early detection? So in the moonshot, uh, George Washington Public Health School came to us and said, we wanna help with tobacco cessation using social media tools, great. Next week, Case Western Cancer Center came in and said, we want to work with tobacco cessation because Cleveland's housing projects have huge rates of lung cancer. So does D.C. I said, you need to meet George Washington. They did. They did this program under the moonshot. Now it's 22 cities funded by NCI for going out to people and getting them tested for lung cancer and helping them stop tobacco products. It takes a lot of lift, a lot of lift. Polio you had to take a sugar cube. Cancer, if you have to see your daughter or your son take two or three shots and you wonder what the impact is, that's because people don't understand science, which you've spent your whole life in science, you understand very well. Thank you. So before we go to the next uh, question, public service announcement to uh, overcome the anarchy that you created. I don't want to be responsible for people looking for their phones. Please return. <laughs> Please return the phone to the person in if front of you. If you forgot your phone, isn't that fun? Isn't that fun? Temporarily? Yes, sir. Over here. Whoops. In presenting your model of the futures market, you said without PBMs. And I'm curious what you believe is the role for PBMs, if any, in a healthy healthcare system. Zero. When I was at Pfizer and they said we were going to give PBMs a rebate for Lipitor after it went off patent, I said, oh, it's a kickback. And they said, oh, no, it's not a kickback. It's a rebate. I said, rebate to whom? To the PBMs. Why? Because they'll put us on a better tier. But the patient doesn't get it, right? No. Well, then it's a kickback. They did not Greg, like me much. Greg, w please explain. What is a PBM? A pharmacy benefit manager determines which drugs are first choice, second choice, third choice for a provider. And if they want to give you the first choice drug, which is expensive, they have to have a reason to do that. But if they want to give you a third level drug, it's a little easier because it's a generic. But the companies that are going to go generic will often pay the, private, the pharmacy benefit manager a rebate that lowers the price to the insurance company through the PBM 
to get a better status in the formulary. This is stupid. It is corrupt. It is not the way the system should work. There should be the drug you need at a price that the insurance company agrees to pay so you can afford it. And the, well, the healthy and the wealthy should be subsidizing the people who are not well, but right now we do it the other way around. If you're poor and sick, you subsidize me. That's not right. You pay the highest price if you're, this, health is the only industry I know where the price of what you buy depends on who you are. If you went to the movie theater and you wanted to buy a ticket, you get a dollar off if you're a senior, but they don't charge you $10 more if you're 50. You go to buy a car, they don't say, well, tell me what you do, and I'll tell you what the price is. But in healthcare, you show up and they say, well, what insurance do you have? The price can be here or it can be here. This makes no sense. It's, we can't fix it. We have to break it and start over. Thank you. Next cool. question. Thank you for your inspiring talk. Thank your you. viewpoint about uh, cancer and fighting cancer are very illuminating. So my question is that, can we uh, borrow some or learn some based on systems thinking and the theoretical models from other challenges, like uh, aging society, poverty elimination, environmental protection, and world peace for a better precision medicine practice? I missed the very last part. Say that again. OK. Can, can we learn something from other challenges? Yes. Yes. From so, the systems I'm thinking of. Yes. Yeah. So interesting. Uh, some friends, we were talking earlier today about a friend of ours named Jesse Dillon, who started a company that gives you how different medical systems around the world would treat the same condition. So Indian medicine via, via, via I can't say it, medicine, Chinese traditional medicine, uh, Western traditional medicine, homeopathic medicine, naturopathic medicine, all have a different approach to things. What we're learning and what we're doing in our prevention program is also including energy balance, which means your food intake, your exercise level, your metabolism, all of those sorts of things. This is another part of putting the person back together again, including things like the microbiome, which we're learning now is incredibly important. So we cannot continue to use a, a, a rifle shot. It has to be a, a net to look at the whole patient's life and see what's, what's driving. You know, there are parts of the country where people get certain cancers. We know it's environmental. The political will hasn't been there to do anything about it, and that has to change. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Plant. I teach uh, computer science across the river. Uh, I'm the author of the book, Why Software Sucks. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and my question is, um, are you, um, in the breakdown of the data sharing, of um, are, are you seeing a lot of that because of bad computer systems, ah. incompatible computer systems, oh, yeah. bad user interfaces and such? Oh, yeah. So uh, several, it's, it's, it's like Maslow's hierarchy. Yes. At the very bottom, you have computer systems that suck because they were designed to suck so you couldn't leave them. And they couldn't interact with other systems. That's which is the, yeah, you got it. the whole electronic mm -hmm. medical record industry is I built mm -hmm. on creating systems that suck that you cannot leave. They're like black holes. Okay. And if you'd leave, it costs you tens of millions of dollars to customize the next one. And the dirty little secret is they're designed for billing, not healthcare. That's one problem. The next problem up is, as you know, just putting data on the internet is not data sharing. There needs to be a definition of the provenance of the data, the quality of the data, and who knows all that? Data scientists, not doctors, not researchers. So you need a marriage of people like you and people like these people doing precision medicine because they didn't spend their life studying data science. You did, but you didn't spend your life studying molecular biology, I don't think. So you have to put those two together. And then there's that top level, which is why should I do it at all? And that's where you get into whining that it's okay to be a hoarder, and it's not. It's just a real simple discussion. You're a hoarder, stop it. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tina Chu, I'm an ophthalmic therapeutic innovator. I was very impressed by the enlightening perspective that you share with us from on the pre precision medicine. Many of the topics are very close to my heart and uh, for example, giving the right drug to the right patient at the right time and the being critical about the precision medicine. One of the most striking one is your Uncle James story, describing how hospitals bury those drunk 
data and the good stuff. And uh, in pharmaceutical research, the same thing. If, you know, they publish paper and the five patents. If we are able to turn that 5% of the patent that s sitting in the patent office, US, I always say we could uh, perhaps live in the Mars. <laughs> turn those really the science knowledge into, into something that can benefit to the patient. From your perspective, from a very strategic policy making perspective, what you are able to propose, make a change in the future, how we really uh, utilize the real world data, the big data arrow, and uh, really convert those into from data to knowledge, and from knowledge to the practice, as what uh, our chair here uh, enlightened in the, in the first uh, paragraph here, turn that into a real world benefit, yes. instead of receiving that. In many <coughs> years ago, I, I think J&J yes. and the Pfizer elegant had all those I'm glad initiatives. You I'm glad you brought that up. I meant to bring it up. Isn't it amazing in 2018, we now think that we should use real world data? Think about that for a minute. What were we using? <laughs> right, what were we using? We were using artificial data with the human equivalent of a white bread pure mouse, right? Now we say, oh, let's, let's use patient reported outcomes. What were we using? We were ignoring the patient's reported outcomes because we didn't trust the patient. So now, this is good, real world data and real world evidence with real world people in trials who have multiple conditions and trusting the patient when they say, I feel good, I feel bad, this was better, whatever. I'm afraid we're, we're going to have to talk to you outside after because we got two we're, other people and I know we're late. You. Yeah, in fact, my, my job more? is to keep this flowing. So I'm already going to cut into your lunch time. Sorry, everybody. So. Four more minutes, fast question. Let's do all three questions and I'll just answer the, bu the bunch. Right. So state your question. How do we get new science funded faster? I found the cause of multiple sclerosis three years ago. And we actually now have a treatment that reverts TH17 cells back to TH2. And I can't get anybody's attention and it would take me three years to go through the NIH. I hear you. I'll come back to that. Yes, Next. sir. Next. Thank you, Analytics Light Intelligence. My question is, uh, as you uh, work to bring more data and connect more data, so with big data and deep learning, wouldn't it supercharge and speed up diagnosis, treatment, and wedding, uh, 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 different treatment? And then second is today, all medical <coughs> colleges should be teaching students a lot more statistics, data science, and analytics, because the future of medicine and doctors is to really become medical data scientists. Yeah, great point. I'll come back to that. Get there. Greg, I've, I've just enjoyed your speech so much, and that was my main comment. I have one other uh, piece of information. I'm Danish. Uh, my name is Gitte Peterson, and I was here five years ago with another precision medicine conference. Um, Obamacare is obviously a band, you know, bandage on a problem that needs a root canal. In Denmark, we have the same outcome in oncology. You can actually dial into each individual hospital to find out how good they are. <clears throat> we pay one third. That means that the U.S. has already already paying for outcomes that we could implement here with a different system. And I think that is a very important piece of information that we we could do this tomorrow if we could change the system. Right. So that's yes. my message. Thank you. So um, last question first, the data question. There are so many things medical colleges don't teach they should start teaching, like nutrition, like genetics a few years ago. The idea that they're also going to start teaching data science and statistics because the doctor's actually going to use it is such a heavy lift. I'll leave it to people who run medical colleges who will tell you that the curriculum is jammed with what they have to know about biology and and uh, you know, um, uh, surgery and anatomy, that stuffing one more thing in. Now, that doesn't stop them from making medical residents work 24-hour shifts, right? So if we could change that and let them sleep a little bit and then give them a few hours of genetics, a few hours of nutrition, a few hours of data science, instead of me knowing that the resident is basically tripping when he comes in after 24 hours, we might get somewhere, but that's not how medical, medical colleges are the, uh, what's the word? They, they are the last bastion 
of the old system that is going to have to change. The question about funding is a perennial question about funding. NIH can't fund everything. There's a bias toward the known. There's a bias toward the people you know. There's a bias toward the institutions you know. So how do you break that? Well, you have to have programs that are designed to break that. I've been arguing for this for a decade. They're just now starting to do some of those kinds of programs that fund younger people, that fund translational science. But the reason I started that company in Grand Central was we wanted people who care about multiple sclerosis to be able to find your company and fund it when for, since 1974, if you're a private company, you could not even talk about it. I couldn't talk about it in front of you without going to jail unless I knew in advance that each of you were worth a million dollars. Think about that. Your government and the Supreme Court agreed, said you cannot talk about a private offering in front of people who aren't wealthy. So it made it really hard for companies to raise money. Now they've changed that, but the SEC killed it, and it's still really hard for small companies to raise money. This is crazy, but it's one more thing we have to change. Uh, and, and next thing we have to change is the speaker. So I have to go. So thank you all very much. So you're going to get a full 15-minute, but no more than 15-minute break. We're taking it out of your lunch.